my screen, but not on the
sort of simulation of seawater, because we know seawater contains water molecules and it contains dissolved sodium chloride, among other things. So that's good news. We need salty solutions. We need solutions with various ions in them. If anyone has a water bottle here, I can see one sitting at the back. If you look at the composition on the water bottle, it'll tell you that the water has some dissolved ions in it. And that's great because we need to have some calcium in our body, we need magnesium, and so on. But on the other side, water can also dissolve pollutants. So again, these are sort of schematic drawings, but you can see over there on your left that copper ions, the U, are surrounded by water molecules. So they, they form a complex with the water molecules, and that keeps the copper dissolved. And likewise, this other schematic shows you a variety of metals dissolved by waters. And this is a concern when we're looking at pollutants in waters. We want to understand how these various potential toxins, like cadmium and arsenic and so on, are dissolved in waters, and then how they behave once they're in those waters. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you uh, now about how water gets polluted. And I'm going to give you two case studies. I'm going to talk about a natural mechanism by which waters become polluted with arsenic, and then talk about what we call anthropogenic or man or human made uh, mechanism due to mining by which, again, waters can become polluted. And then with both examples, I'm going to give you some, tell you the bad stuff and tell you that it's sort of science stuff, and then go over some options for the ways that we remediate and protect water systems, or at least the ways we do it today. Okay, so let's now go down to Bangladesh and India. And it, we know it's a, a very interesting place, very hot. And like anywhere on Earth, we need water to survive. So here's some children having a good old swim in the water, really enjoying themselves and obviously using the water for, for hygiene in this case. But like everywhere, they need water to drink, they use water for irrigation, they have a lot of rice crops and other types of crops in these areas. And so water is a, a big thing for them. And we know in these countries that traditionally water is, because it's very hot, it can become contaminated with pathogenic organisms, um, leading to problems with your stomach and so on if you, if you go to these places. So in the 1970s, um, there was a big program looking at um, how to remedy this and maybe provide other sources of water that were free of these types of pathogens. So uh, a number of NGOs got together and they went into villages and they installed two wells like you see here. So these are great, they're right in the village, people don't have to walk for a long way, it's got a very simple hand pump and it provides water quite readily. These are areas that have monsoon climate, so they receive a lot of water part of the year, and then not so much water the rest of the year. So this was the solution, and they thought it was a good thing. However, within about 10 years, people started to come to their doctors with, with symptoms like this. Um, so you can see there's two things actually going on here, more evident on the feet perhaps. You have black spots forming, and you have a lot of thickening of the skin, and that's in both cases, on the hands and feet often to begin with. So this puzzled people because they'd never been seen in this area before, but a, a doctor in Calcutta, Kolkata, um, eventually realized this was symptoms of arsenic poisoning. And it wasn't just one person, it was a lot of people coming down with these symptoms. So the question was, where on earth is this arsenic coming from? And that puzzled people for a long time. Now we know arsenic is a pretty bad poison. It's throughout it literature, um, we know that Certain people have died of arsenic. It's used in rat poison. And here's Napoleon, famous Napoleon, um, who, when he was, his hair was looked at, high arsenic concentrations were found in his hair. Um, now, at the time, this was quite big news, and, and we thought maybe Napoleon had been poisoned by arsenic, maybe it was added to his food, or maybe he had a particular like, type of really beautiful green wallpaper, but unfortunately, the pigment was made from an arsenic-bearing mineral. And when that gets moldy, there's a reaction and arsenic is released as a gas. So that was one way that perhaps Napoleon was poisoned by arsenic. Now I think that's been discredited to some extent and other reasons have been found for Napoleon's death, but no, nevertheless there was high arsenic in his hair found. Um, likewise, there's been some stories closer to home. In Manchester in the, the 1900, 70 people died from chronic arsenic poisoning. There were 6,000 people affected as well. 
And this was because of beer. We all know about beer. We like beer or wine, I guess. Um, and in that case, there was a lot of arsenic found in the beer. Um, one milligram per liter is a very, very high amount. The current World Health Organization guideline for arsenic, you get this right, I think is about 10 to the minus 6 compared to 1. So that's just an enormous amount compared to what it actually should be. So this was had a bad effect that led to something good that the Royal Commission came along and tried to set some guidelines about arsenic. So back to Bangladesh and India. This only shows a map of Bangladesh. The Indian portion is just to the left. Um, but because this was starting to be realized, the, the first thing we do as geologists is we go in and make maps because we want to see how things are distributed. So the British Geological Survey and the, the survey in Bangladesh got together and they went around the country and they surveyed wells, testing them for arsenic. And basically, the, the wells with the, the red stuff, or the red dots are the most high. They're greater than 200 <coughs> micrograms per liter. In Bangladesh, the drinking water guideline is 50. So that's four times higher than it should be. There are some sort of salmon colored ones that are high, and the low ones are blue. Now, that's a very interesting map because it shows a few things. There is sort of a concentration of red and pink in the south, but even in one area, I just picked one, here you've got some red next to some blue. So it's not very obvious how you can predict where the high arsenic might be found. Now, this is, this is a big health crisis, and it's still going on today. And so this led, has led, ever since this is about the late, I guess it's right, sort of late 1900, uh, 1999, the survey came out. So since then, a lot of people have been carrying out research on various aspects, but also to figure out how the arsenic got there and why is it so, why do we see the distribution that there is? And I worked on this a little bit, but mostly with a professor at UCL named John MacArthur, who, who sort of led a very good program trying to understand the mechanism. So some, a lot of this is, is John, has been led by John. Okay, so now I'm sorry, this for some reason has flipped upside down. But what you can see, this is the concentration of arsenic with depth. And actually, this is the top, and that's the bottom. So I apologize, I'm not sure how I did that. But what you can see is most of the high arsenic is near the surface. It only goes down to about maybe 40, 40 meters. So it's shallow aquifers that contain a lot of the arsenic. So that was one really good finding. If we can perhaps drill deeper aquifers, we might get out of that arsenic-contaminated zone. But most of the tube wells that were put in in Bangladesh and West Bengal and India went into that shallow aquifer. So they're tapping a lot of this high arsenic water. And there are a lot of wells in these countries. And as, as you can see, a lot of them just put in individual villages. OK, so I'm just going to give you a shot, a shot of this. But this is work that John has led on and I helped with. Um, and we've done various things. We've analyzed water compositions. And we've also looked at the aquifer. So the aquifer is, a, in this case, the pile of sediments that host the groundwater that these wells are tapping. And so we've looked at the sediments, and we've looked at their color, which I'll explain in a minute, and we've looked at how they, how they built up over time. So these sediments are, they're called, they're Holocene in age, so they're less than 10,000 years old. And largely, they, they come from weathering of the Himalaya. So we know the Himalaya is rising but it weathers and it sheds a lot of sediment. It ends up going down the river system and depositing in the Bay of Bengal where these arsenic contaminated waters are. So we've, we've had a pretty good stab at putting the sediment, how the sediments have built up together. But what's very interesting is the color. Now when we're geologists, and I know there's some geologists in the audience, uh, when we study mineralogy, we're sometimes told to, to look at the color but be suspicious of the color because it might not tell you everything you need to know. But in this case, the color is very indicative. Where we see orange, sort of orangey brown sands, there's very little arsenic in the, in, if the well is tapping those orange sands. If, however, we see gray sands, the arsenic is high. And actually, it's the drillers in the area who found this. It wasn't any scientists. The drillers knew that when you have gray sand, you're going to get arsenic. When you have brown sand, you wouldn't. So John and all of us have sort of worked on this and put it together. And we think it's due to some geochemical processes that are aided by bacteria. Because we now know bacteria live everywhere on Earth, and they, they help and mediate and participate in geochemical reactions. And basically what's happening is you've got two types of iron in the system. 
Where you see the, the brownish orange color, it's iron, what we call iron three plus, it's oxidized iron. Where you see the gray iron, it's iron two plus, or it's reduced iron. So it's a process called redox that we see, a change between oxidation and reduction. And that is the main driver for the arsenic pollution. Now, where does the arsenic come from? Well, in fact, it comes from the Himalaya. And if we have, if we take a sand grain over there and look at it, what we would see is the sand grain is mostly made of quartz, but it has a very fine coating of the sort of orange iron oxide. So any of you who are gardeners, if you dig your soils, you probably get some nice colors like that. That means you've got iron in your soil, and it's in the form of iron oxide. But iron oxide is a wonderful mineral for taking out contaminants. So if you were to put iron oxide in a beaker with some arsenic, the arsenic would, would bond with the surface of the iron oxide. And that's exactly what's happened. The sands coming down from the Himalaya have these iron oxide coatings with tiny amounts of arsenic on them, not very much. You wouldn't think enough to make this arsenic pollution. But because there's so much sand, and there's a lot of this reduction going on, that reduction process to turn that from orange to gray releases the arsenic, and that's the big problem. So, I apologize for this, but I'll, I'll try and explain it. So this is what we sort of do when we're putting sediments and trying to figure out sediments, and in this case, the colors. So this is a sort of schematic picture of the aquifer in the area. And you can see, we've got, where you see these dotty things, that's supposed to represent sand. So a lot of the aquifer is sand. Occasionally, you get layers like this, red one, which is a paleosol, which is an old soil layer. So that means the sand has sat around for a while, and a soil is formed on top. Bear in mind, it's been accumulating for about 10,000 years. So that clay layer will cap this sand. And when you think about hydrogeology, or the way that groundwaters move around, that then protects these sediments from any sort of downward movement. Um, in the sands as well, you've got those little sort of black layers, sorry, I haven't got a pen, but you can see these little black lenses here. What that represents is organic material. So think about these areas now, but you've got very tropical areas and you've got mangrove swamps growing. And exactly the same thing happened in the past. So what you're looking at is a record of the past climate and development of these sediments. So where you get those black layers, that's now peat, but it represents vegetation that existed at the time. Now, unfortunately, that organic material is not great for the arsenic story. Because what happens is the organic material is one of the causes for turning this orange sand to gray sand. So that drives our geochemical reaction. And so what we think is that we thought all of these sediments used to be this color, originally. They came down from the Himalaya, they were deposited, and they were orange to begin with. But because they've been buried with the organic material that you see there, we've set up this sort of reaction pot, like a big cooking pot, and that has turned the orange sands to gray. By doing so, that has released the arsenic. So where you get the gray sands over there, those wells, the AP and the FP in this case, are full of arsenic. But at the moment, the DP, especially down here, there's no arsenic because it's still orange, and the arsenic hasn't been released and it's protected by this paleosol. So that's a double good thing. So one option would be to find out where these orange sands still are and drill and use those for our drinking water. But there's one small problem with that, and it's this big arrow here. Now we know that groundwater moves. It doesn't just sit there like a swamp, it's not stagnant, stagnant sorry. it moves, it flows underground. Now it does so very slowly, but the idea is if this groundwater can flow from here to here, it can carry that organic material with it, and eventually that orange will turn to gray, and possibly arsenic will be released as well. So that's what we call, that's our model at the moment. It seems to be holding up, and it has been a guideline to maybe where we can drill for arsenic-free water, at least for now. So just to finish off the model and throw in a bit of bacteria, 
Uh, we also work, the great thing about science is that you can collaborate with all sorts of other scientists and other people as well, working in health and, and whatever. And so we collaborate with microbiologists because they understand the bacteria and what the bacteria are doing. And people who have worked on this have agreed with the geochemical process and they say basically these bacteria will attach themselves to these iron oxide coated grains, like you see here, and they do, they sort of breathe, but they don't breathe oxygen like us, they breathe <coughs> iron three. So that's what they do. And we breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. The bacteria breathe in iron three plus and breathe out iron two plus. But unfortunately, by doing so, any arsenic, it's not shown, but any arsenic in this layer is released into the water. And the only way the bacteria can do this is if there's organic material around. So the fact that there's all this lovely peat in these sediments is great for the bacteria, but not so good for the arsenic, because it means the bacteria can cause this reaction to happen, and more and more arsenic is released. So that's where we are at the moment. There's still a lot of work going on. Um, it's a huge area. Uh, John and his colleagues and others have worked in small areas, and now we're sort of trying to piece it together and identify the bacteria and carry on with the research. Because often research raises a lot of questions. You answer some, but you raise others. OK, so what can be done about this? Well, there have been lots of things tried. Um, one of the things that was tried early on was to go around and paint wells, just like, sorry, that's so blurry, but get the idea. If it's red, that means it's high in arsenic. So they painted good wells red, and they painted Sorry, bad wells red and good wells blue. Now, the problem with that was that because of the groundwater flow that I told you about, and because there's a monsoon and the water table goes up and down quite a lot, the arsenic concentrations might not stay the same from one well to another. So there has been work, and you can see this line going up this way, to suggest that arsenic concentrations increase over time. So if a well was green to begin with, it might become red in the long run. So they need to be monitored a lot. And the other thing is the social aspect. And, and I suppose it's totally understandable. If you have a well that's just outside your house, and you're not getting sick, you may as well think, well, I'll just leave that. It's just easy, even though it's contaminated with arsenic. And there are villages, I've been to one, where they drilled a well into the deep part, where it's arsenic-free. But because it's further away, people still use the arsenic-contaminated well. So there's, there's lots of social issues as well. Perfectly understandable. OK, so the other possibility is, as I said, we go and we drill into this brown aquifer, which is an older aquifer, and doesn't have much arsenic. That that's, has been looked at. It has been done. Um, but again, as I said, over time, because of groundwater flow, it's possible that these orange sands might turn gray over time. And it's possible that the arsenic might be released. The time frame for that is, is probably a little bit longer term. So at the moment, it's actually quite a good solution if you have the money to drill a deep well, because drilling a deep well is more expensive than drilling a shallow well. But that's certainly an option. Uh, the third solution, again, which is seeing a lot of work, is, is engineering the situation. So providing filters to filter out the arsenic and then provide clean drinking water. And that certainly is being done on a local scale, a household scale, a village scale, and so on. And it's remarkable the engineering solutions that have come up. Anything from iron filings to, to local materials to minerals have, have been tried. And certainly this is a way forward. Um, but of course, it depends on the, the availability. And like any filter system, you have to keep replacing things. And so it's just a matter of maintaining these systems. And, and it works very well. Especially iron, as I mentioned, it's very, very good at taking out arsenic from water. So a lot of the systems are iron-based. And then fourth is to go back right to the beginning and use surface water again. And that's being looked at as well. Um, we know, of course, that a lot of these hot countries, we've got bacterial and viral contaminants in, in waters. But their systems are looking at rainwater collection, which is free of that treating surface water. There's a big monsoon, so we know there's a lot of water at certain times of the year. So really coming full circle and going back to the surface water option. So it, a lot is being done. We know about the problem now. A lot's being done research-wise, but of course a lot's being done engineering-wise as well. But you won't, you'll continue to hear about this. 
that's not just India and Bangladesh, it's actually many countries around the world that are affected by arsenic problems. Okay, just let me have a little wet and whistle. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you more. We're going to go onto an anthropogenic system. That was all natural pollution, actually. It's all natural processes, nothing to do with man made um, issues. Uh, now we're going to look at anthropogenic issues. So the first question for you is we've all got these amazing technology. We've got mobile phones, we've got blenders, if you have them, we've got bicycles. And what do they have in common? Well, they're all made of metal, or some sort of metal that's been mined. So the first thing I want to say is, basically, I'm not up here to say mining is a bad thing. We need mining because we, we use a lot of technology and we're used to it, and it, it does us a lot of good. Um, so mining is something that's been around with humans probably ever since we've been on the face of this earth, and certainly in the, in the record for at least 5,000 years, at least. Probably more, that's an underestimate. Uh, now, of course, the downside of mining is um, it produces waste, and it produces a lot of waste. And that's because, if you think about it, um, in an ore deposit, for example, that maybe has 3% copper, that's actually a pretty good grade, that means that 3% of the volume of rock is the copper that we want. Everything else is waste. So any mining operation does produce a lot of waste. It produces liquid waste, like that waste you see over there, which I'll tell you about a bit more in a minute, and a lot of solid waste. And this is a global issue. Every single country, probably, I think, has had some sort of mining, either going on now or going on in the past. Um, so over there, you can see Kalgoorlie in Western Australia, it's a big gold mine. And you can see the footprint of the mining signature, the super pit and all the waste rock and tailings repositories, is probably bigger than the town itself. And the town is right next door, so it's going to feel the effect of any, if there are negative effects from the mining. Uh, this is a real coal mine in Bolivia, somewhere I've worked for many years. And this is an old picture now, but it's a dry season in Bolivia. And at that time, um, the, dry, the river was gray. And that's because it's full of mine waste. That was pretty much it. So it's full of something we call tailings, which is a leftover material after processing the ores. Um, and it's quite an interesting color, but it's probably not how you want to see your river. And this is an old massive sulfide mine in Cyprus. Um, this Cyprus gets its name from copper. And these are old, small copper mines. Um, most of them are abandoned today, but you can see that they contain these pit waters that are full of acidic water left over in this type of mine waste as well. So mine waste is a global issue. And um, well, we could spend our lives, and I mean, Pat and I, who's, who's working with me, we do go around the world and we do look at mine waste and try and find solutions and understand how it behaves in the environment. OK, so I'll just tell you how we're going to look at the water side. This is all about water. And there are lots of different types of water waste, water mine waste. And we generally classify them chemically based on their pH, so their level of acidity. And by far the most common is this one AMD, acid mine drainage. And like it sounds, the, the, waste, the water waste from this are acidic. They're less than pH 5. And if you know about pH, they even go down to pH minus 3. And that might sound a bit strange. If you've done any chemistry, we generally are taught that the pH scale only goes from 0 to 14. But there's a place in California, Iron Mountain over there, where there's so much of this reaction going on, I'll tell you about that in a minute, that there's just a lot of acidity generated. And it's kind of broken the record for pH. And they've had to design new pH meters to, to record it. Um, this is a Rio Tinto in Spain. Uh, it's a river of site that's probably, again, been mined for at least 5,000 years. It's part of the Iberian Pyrite Belt. And it's a fascinating river, um, geochemically it is, because it, it's that color for about 8 kilometers, from the mine site all the way down to the estuary. And Rio Tinto means red river, and it gets its name, obviously, from that color. Now, this is, um, I should say, this is actually a natural process, too. So the reason that this occurs largely is the weathering of this mineral pyrite, which is fool's gold or iron sulfide. And we know that iron sulfide occurs naturally. It occurs in rocks and in minerals. And so there is a component of this type of thing which is natural. And it's called acid rock drainage as opposed to acid mine drainage. But when it's generated by mining activities, we call it acid mine drainage. And it's a fairly simple reaction. Pyrite, which is iron sulfide, it's formed 
deep in the earth. So it's stable down there, but as soon as we mine it and bring it to the surface, it becomes unstable. And it reacts very readily with two of the things that are really common on the Earth's surface. That's water and oxygen. And there are a lot of bacteria, a whole families of bacteria that oxidize iron and oxidize sulfur that really thrive. You might think that's dead, but it's not. It's full of bacteria. They thrive in these acid, metal-rich conditions. And these bacteria sort of catalyze the reactions. But once it starts, and we start generating products down here, the reaction sort of self-perpetuates and it, it goes ballistic, essentially. So the products of this reaction are acidity, that's one thing, and that's why the waters get very acid. You see a lot of sulfate, a lot of iron, but a lot of things that I've called contaminants. And that's because pyrite, um, it's a very interesting structure, it's a cubic structure, but it can contain a lot of minor elements in the mineral. So you can have some arsenic in there, some copper, some cadmium, and so on. And also pyrite is associated with other, other minerals that contain these contaminants. So once this reaction gets going, it's a very vigorous one, it happens very readily, it can lead to a lot of release of contaminants into water systems. And so, sorry for all the numbers, but I just wanted to show you the difference between acid mine drainage waters and what we call normal average world river. So if we just take a couple of examples, we have a look at sulfate. Here the average world river is 5.3 to 16.8, compared to acid mine drainage in a, a mine in California, which is 11,200. If we have a look, there's no arsenic there, if we have a look at copper, again the, the world river is really low, 0 0.00148, and there's the copper in acid mine drainage, 9.64. So this is a fairly typical acid mine drainage water in that it's not just a couple of elements that are rich, it's a lot of them. So acid mine drainage is probably the number one problem facing the mining industry. Because of these metals, because of the acidity, you can see the pH in that mine is 1.85, that's really acid. And because when it gets into streams, it, it causes a lot of things to die, unless they adapt over time, like in the Rio Tinto. So it's a really big problem, and I'll, I'll tell you how it's worked on a little bit later. So that's by far the most common. There are other types of mine drainage waters as well. And again, they're classified on pH. So there's what we call near neutral drainage, and that's pH maybe around 6 to 8. And high pH drainage, and that's pH, well, anywhere from 8 to 12 and so on. Um, and they tend to have different chemical characteristics to those that we've just seen. So the pH is obviously different, but we see different types of contaminants and they're associated with different types of, of ore deposits. So often uranium tailings, aluminium uh, processing is one, molybdenum is another. And if we have a look at the chemistry of those waters, um, again, it's the same average world river water, but you can see that there's, we've got slight differences over here. So the pH obviously is higher. Um, we have still a lot of iron and sulfate. Um, but we start to see aluminium, and I haven't put it on here, but you probably see a lot of chrome, vanadium, arsenic, and different suite of elements in these types of waters. So they need different types of treatment compared to the acid waters. And again, because we've, a lot of research is done on this, not only by universities, but by government, the British Geological Survey, the United States Geological Survey, we have a good understanding of at least the chemistry of these systems. Um, and that helps us to understand perhaps how we can treat them. Now, the other thing that happens with mines um, and mine waste is that we have accidents. So, one of the big solid types of mine waste is this thing called tailings. And here's an example in, in Kid Creek in Northern Ontario. And tailings are a sort of necessary, well, byproduct of, of the ore extraction. So basically you crush the ore and you do various things and often add um, different solvents to leach or take out the metals and so on that you're interested in. But you're left behind with a fine-grained residue that has to be disposed of. And in this case, you might be able to see in the background there's sort of a wall. Generally, tailings, in most places, are stored in the dam behind an impoundment. Now, if that's managed um, and if it's built on a in a good engineering design and on something that's quite stable, um, you're fine. And over time, the tailings dam will fill up, and hopefully the company will have a plan for what to do with it when it's full. 
And that might involve tapping it or seeding it with a, a grass or a type of vegetation that's tolerant to the metals and so on. And it, then it would just be left alone maybe to turn into a golf course or you know, something that people are going to grow vegetables on, essentially. So they can be managed very well. But unfortunately, there are accidents with table stands. And this is one that happened in, in Spain in 1998. Um, happened overnight in the 25th of April, so nobody was killed. Um, and again, I'm sorry I don't have a point here, but in the preschool picture, you can see that way up at the top, um, there's a sort of little black wall. That's the paling stand. And it's a, another copper mine in southern Spain. And the tailings from this copper mine were put into the tailings dam. Unfortunately, the dam was built on a material called marl. And marl contains a lot of clays. Now, clays are really interesting minerals. <coughs> and one of the reasons they are is they can take in water into their structure. Um, some of the, we use clays for gardening sometimes. If you want to have your, um, I can say, if you want to go away on holiday, you sort of fill up your pot with a certain type of clay and it retains the water very well. Well, that's what the marl does. It retains water very well, but when it's a dry season, it'll dry out. So it swells and then it shrinks. And unfortunately, that was what the tailings dam was built on, and it caused failure of the dam. And so after that spill, you can see the gray material lined the river system and then spread out down here. And fortunately, the, there's a lot of remediation done right away. The remediation done here was really good. Um, a big wall was built down here to protect something down here called the Damiana National Park, which is a major migratory stopping on point for birds coming from um, northern Europe to Africa. And there was big concern to try and protect that. So the wall was built, and that did stop a lot of the material, the water, and the solids getting further south. And then there was a big program of digging up the tailings, driving them back up the system, and putting them in the open pit from the mining. So that really did a lot to forestall a lot of the problems that really could have happened. Um, so we've, we've done some research in this area, and there's a tailings dam that's broken, you can see there. Um, and there were two phases of cleanup. The first was very efficient. Um, a lot of the vegetation was stripped, a lot of the tailings were removed, and for some places it was four meters thick. But there were still patches where there were tailings. And where, where there were, you got these little pools after rain that were filled with water that basically became acid line drainage. So we've done some work on various things. One is to look at the arsenic in these waters. And we were able to show how the arsenic evolved. So it was basically weathering of minerals that led to the arsenic. But luckily, once the pool dried out, that arsenic then sorbed or bonded with iron oxide and became stable again. So, there was a second program of cleanup after this, and that really got rid of most of the tailings. And today, about 10 years later afterwards, the river is now a natural corridor full of vegetation. So it, it has recovered at least to some state where there's plants and animals and so on growing again. Now, there have been lots of other accidents. Tailings dam failures are unfortunately more common than we'd like them to be. Uh, this is one that made the news in, like, in 2010 in Hungary. This, you can see this is a NASA picture, actually. Um, the red sort of line of, of spinning through here. Um, this was a aluminium processing plant, and it, it failed, and there was a big spill of red mud. Again, the cleanup was very effective. They, they dug everything up, and they added some minerals, and that neutralized. Um, in this case, the pH was about 12 in that case, so very caustic. And there was a big spill in Romania, which um, released a lot of cyanide. So they are more common than we'd like them to be. But one thing as scientists we do is we study the after effects of these, uh, both the tail and stand spills and also the cleanup to understand how it affects the environment and then make recommendations to, to companies, maybe how to prevent them, or at least how they might impact on the environment, which we don't want to happen. Okay, um, now the other way that we can contaminate waters from mining is, is a sort of hidden way that you might not think about. Um, so here's mining in Britain. Um, we know it's gone on for many, many, many years. And this, I'm sorry, it's only England. This was a report we did for the Environment Agency of England and Wales. So we didn't have a mandate to do Scotland. So it's only English mining that you see here. 
Um, now, we know mining has been going on for many years, thousands of years, but the peak mining was in the Industrial Revolution. And it's, that really has affected a lot of floodplains throughout England and Wales. Um, and this has left behind a legacy. Now, some of it's very good because there's a lot of mining history and mining legacy and buildings and places like this. This is the Yorkshire Dales National Park. Fascinating places to go, beautiful places. Um, but some of the issues to do with this are that a lot of the, the mining technology at that time wasn't particularly effective. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the metal was recovered because of the techniques that were used. And unfortunately, a lot of the waste was ejected into rivers because they didn't have capacities to build dams to hold the waste back. So we've ended up with piles of waste like this. And, um, well, a lot of the rivers, yeah, a lot of these floodplains in, in northern England in particular, where I've worked, have quite a lot of mining waste in them, still. Um, and that waste is actually quite heavily contaminated with lead and sink. Um, so we know that the, the sediments store that lensing at the moment. But obviously what we're concerned about and what the Environment Agency is concerned about is how that lensing might be transferred from the sediment into the water. Because we don't want the waters to be contaminated in particular because they're used for a lot of different uses. So we've done quite a lot of work to understand how these sediments might release these metals to the water. Now, what th this is happens all over the world. So this is Bolivia, again. And this is the river, this is a dry season picture of the Rio Pocamayo, again, where the river is gray during the dry season. This is an older picture, they built tailing sands since then, so hopefully the situation is improving. But that river is full of tailings. And even this pink sand is still the same, it just means this is reacted to form this. So the whole of the Pocamayo Basin is full of contaminated sediment. And one of the terms that sort of fantastic terms that's been coined is this idea of a chemical time bomb. Because we know we've got a lot of contaminated sediment sitting in this river system. We know that if we're getting bigger floods because of climate change and sort of disruption to various climate patterns. So there's quite a bit of concern that these big floods might be remobilizing this, this sediment in the near future. And that's one of the ways that we can get contaminants from the sediment into the water. If we suspend all that sediment and react it with the water, we often see spikes of metal in the water. So that's one issue. The other issue is once you have the sediment sitting in a floodplain, it doesn't just sit there, it reacts. It reacts with all the materials, it reacts with some of the organic material, and it can mobilize through the profile. Now, the good news is that what we're finding is yes, there is remobilization. This is some work, gosh, I did years ago that a student is doing at the moment in, uh, the north, in northern England. And what we find is there, there are little pockets of remobilization. But the good news is new minerals form. So this is a mineral, is it right there? Oh, so thank you, sorry. It's full of iron and manganese. So it's an iron manganese bearing mineral. And the reason it's so bright in places is because it's taken lead into its structure. So even though there's a little bit of maybe local remobilization of lead, these minerals will form and take it back again. And luckily in these river systems, we do not see a lot of lead in the system. So that's probably why. Minerals are doing their job very efficiently. Zinc is more of a problem though. And so there's a lot of research going on. These will take zinc into their structure, but the zinc still gets into the water and gets into the river system. So the Environment Agency has put quite a bit of money into developing pilot schemes take that thing out. So they're aware of the problem, and we need to still understand a lot more about the minerals in the system. So there, there's good news there. The lead's really not moving around very much. OK, so as I said, mining contamination is a big global problem. Alpha mine drainage is a hugely expensive problem for mining industries, and actually for governments, too, because there's a lot of mines that have been abandoned. Um, they're old mines, historic mines, maybe companies have gone bankrupt, and so governments have to take responsibility for them. So it's a hugely costly problem um, that's quite everywhere. The other thing is, from a sort of scientific point of view, is that this weathering, this mine waste, impacts on our global cycles. So at the very beginning I showed you the water cycle, but we can also construct cycles for sulfur, for iron, any element from the periodic table. And the, 
fact that we're putting so much mine waste into the environment and it's reacting so well means we're weathering, we're adding zinc to our rivers, we're adding sulfate to our rivers. So that's putting an imprint on the natural cycles. And so that's another thing we're trying to understand. Well, how much of an imprint has this mine waste actually made? But again, there's good news. And we do work very hard to look at ways to, to sort of ameliorate these problems. Um, this is work done by a, a guy called Bert Lodemoser, who's now at Exeter. And he sort of came up with a pyramid of an ideal situation. So ideally, you want to be at the top of the pyramid and prevent this happening at all. Well, we know that there's mining going on. And we know it has gone on in the past. So that's really an ideal thing. Then going down the pyramid, you, you sort of go from the best to the worst option. If we can reuse the material or recycle them, great. The worst option, actually, is to try and treat them. Often because the scale of the problem is so large, and to treat is very expensive. And it requires not only one-off treatment, you have to keep treating the systems. So here, just to give you a list of things, are some of the things that are done. And it's just really to show you that there are, again, engineers, are, you know, there are a lot of ways that we know, that engineers know, to develop ways to, to solve these problems. And this is research that's still going on. And now we work as geologists, we work with engineers to you know, help them understand the material, to get out in the field and look at the problems as well. So some of the ones that work very well are the ones at the top, passive treatment. So that involves making minerals that then take these contaminants into their structures. Uh, what else have we got? And this is a one that's actually taking, um, getting a lot more interest. So looking at waters, and trying to recover the metals from these waters. We know that acid mine drainage waters contain a lot of metals. Why don't we try and recover them and use them so we don't have to mine again? So there are lots of different options. Um, now, of course, there's lots of issues with these. Um, the technologies tend to be specific to certain sites because every single site is slightly different. So it has to be engineered for whatever site you're actually looking at. Um, it's not necessarily one strategy, you often have to look at several, and the cost goes up likewise, and they require maintenance. And here's an example of treatment at Iron Mountain, the place with the really low pH, where we treat acid mine drainage basically by raising the pH. So we add lime to the system, that raises the pH and causes precipitation of this beautiful ochre. And the ochre is fantastic, you could actually use it for painting if you wanted to, but uh, it does contain lots of toxic metals, so you might not want that on the wall. Um, but it is, it is one of the tried and tested systems to treat acid mine drainage. But there are two issues. One, you have to find something to do with the waste you produced, and you have to keep adding lime. It's not just a one-off treatment. You have to do something with this and keep the process going. But it, it does work. Okay, so to finish off, um, with the mining side anyway, there are lots of things that, that need to be done both from a sort of societal point of view and research point of view. We obviously need metals and we shouldn't, you know, we should be aware of the fact that mining is going to go on and we need mining to go on. So there are ways to balance metal recovery with environmental protection. I've seen loads of great examples um, and it, it does involve cost and money, but good examples where mine waste is controlled and treated well and everyone's sort of on board with it. So that's one thing that we need to do. Um, we need to sort of understand, because it's all about water, how the water cycle in particular is affected by mining. So that's also how much contaminant we're adding to systems, how much we might be changing the water table. So this is an example of um, a big lithium mine in uh, northwest Argentina. So these are big saline lakes. And they put up solar cells like this, and they evaporate the water, and they get out lithium salts for our batteries and things. But they're, they're possibly, we don't know, they're possibly changing the balance of the water because they're doing this, this evaporation. So we need to look at not only the contaminants, but the water cycle itself. And of course, we're researchers here at Birkbeck, and, and we really want to help, and we want to understand these, these processes. We want to know how water's become polluted. We want to know what the minerals are that maybe are controlling the water becoming polluted, or even the minerals we could use to remediate that as well. 
So we need to be out in the field doing sampling. We need to be working with people and other types of scientists to really help and try and understand these processes. And that's, that's what we do in the sciences here at Birkbeck. And then um, we also do, in parallel, we actually like to tinker in the lab. And that's what we do, we're scientists, so we like to go in and also kind of cook. So this is a, a, just an example of a project uh, one of my students did some years ago, and he made minerals. So he, he kind of got his ingredients together, he got a hot plate, he stirred everything up, and he made some minerals. And this one's called jarosite. And this jarosite, he put some lead and arsenic in, and then he reacted it to see what happened. And so this is quite useful because we can then use these ideal model systems to predict the reactions that might occur and then try to apply this to real life situations. So, and it's fun. It's really fun to play in the lab, I must say. And it gives good results. But I think are useful. So that's what I'd like to tell you. Um, and I'll take any questions. Thanks for listening. Yeah, I just wanted to know globally um, how much are the mining companies held accountable for paying for the remediation process? Because um, I know they are in the UK in terms of other processes. Globally, not so much, probably. Um, if I had to guess, I'd say maybe a third to a quarter of mining companies around the world. In terms of because it's the, the, the states, the, the countries that are. Um, it's, uh, it's the legislation and the money, actually. Um, because actually, new mines that come on stream in certain countries, I know about Canada actually, because I'm from there, of course. New mines in Canada are very heavily legislated. Before you mine, you have to have, you have to put funds aside every year for any accidental cleanup, but also for closing the mine at the end. So it's a real money issue. Um, and also, you have to have even before you mine, you have to have done a lot of work on the chemistry of the area to understand how, if you had an accident, how that might impact on the area. So, very strict in countries like that. But the legislation is getting a lot better in, in a lot of places. Um, it's a lot more strict, but there, there are still a lot of places where it either doesn't exist or there's corruption or other problems. And the other issue, of course, is the legacy of the historic waste, which a lot of people have no the governments end up taking care of it if they can. So it, it's a big problem. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard about uh, this thing called fracking. Fracking, yes. Oh, right. well, what's the reality? What I mean, can you give us a. <laughs> you know what? I, I really don't, I couldn't. It's not really my field. Fracking is more of an oil geologist thing. I do know a little bit about it. Um, I know that it's sort of high pressure water used to sort of go down and, and try and blast out the gas. And I know that um, the issue is that both, I think they use a lot of chemicals in the waters to release, and it can release unknown things in the groundwater. Um, the oil industry people tell me it's been going on for years anyway in, this, in their industry. I, I don't think we really know what the impacts are going to be yet. So sorry to not fully answer your question. It's not really my, my field. But there is a lot going on. In fact, I think there's the government, the in parliament, they're having a big session on it soon. So we'll hear a lot more about it soon. Um, no, you're fine. Well, sorry, there's also, there's always a tiny, tiny, tiny bit, we can never say zero, but, but you're absolutely fine. Our waters here in the UK are, are heavily regulated, they're tested regularly. If there are issues, then mechanisms are put in place to, to remove contaminants. So there's no option if you're right. very, well below the recommended limit. That's good. Yeah. Uh, we're hearing about uh, how much potable water is there left in the world? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, because of the contamination and yeah. the issue of how much drinkable water is there? Okay. Well, that's a good question. Um, the water is drinkable because it's manufactured now, certainly in our country. Um, water, water is a product. You know, the water that we get from all the water companies is processed water. So if you were to go out and drink agricultural water, you'd be drinking quite a lot of nitrate, for example. Sorry, I should have, I mean yeah. fresh water. Fresh water. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, that's a good question globally. I'm guessing. Um, I, I would hope it'd be at least 80% or higher. That's a complete guess. 80% or higher, I'm hoping. Yeah. 
I hope. It depends what you, I mean, even places like the Arctic have minor amounts. If you look at some of the, you've heard of things in the past about the polar bears getting metals in their liver. And that's because the waters are contaminated with small amounts of trace organics from atmospheric composition. Well, that's natural. Well, that's, that's an anthropogenic problem. So you could either go from 80% be hopeful to saying that every water system in the world has been affected in one way or another, either, either by sort of man-made problems or natural weathering as well. It's not just, not just us that are doing things. It's, it's natural processes too. That's a good question, actually. Someone needs to look at that. Are we safer to boil the water before we drink here in London, or are we going to No, no, London water is it's fine. Um, the only thing I do with my water at home is filter it, because it's got a lot of calcium carbonate in it. Um, the, the water is good. You don't need to boil it, no. I'm just trying to understand, I mean, regarding mining, mm. we can try to manage the pollution, but it's always going to be there. It is always going to be there, yeah. And actually, the word you've used is really important. So when we did that work for the Environment Agency here in England, we first set out to, to sort of come up with the ultimate remediation plan for all these rivers, that's what we were looking at. And um, we realized that the scale of the issue was just too big. We couldn't go in and remediate a whole river system. So the, the issue is actually management. So understanding where the pollutants are, understanding how they behave, and then saying, okay, you shouldn't graze on that field, for example, but that, that's okay for your cattle. Or you shouldn't use the water immediately after a storm, because we know a lot of pollutants run off, but at this time of year, it's fine. So manage, if we manage things properly, things, things are okay. And then maybe if there are hot spots that are terrible, we can remediate those. So understanding the issue and management is absolutely the way to go, as far as I know. Anyway. So it's not, it's not a hopeless case at all. Yeah. It, it always sounds worse when I put up all these pictures and say it's contaminated everywhere. Um, you know, we, we're healthy and we survive, so it, it can be managed very well. Yeah. Yep. Well, uh, in your first slide, uh, the impact of water has impacts on the social fabric of society. I mean, what's the reality of, of the mismanagement of water? I mean, like they say, the next war is going to be over water. Well, they do. Don't. Yeah, and I and wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. That's, that's more than a pollution issue. That's a, a not often a damming issue or a diverting river issue or overuse of water issue. But yes, I, I would think that could be an issue. Overuse, um, drought, ch changing climate is a big problem with water. Um, yeah, I wouldn't go lightly on that. You know, it's something, and we hear from our com water companies and government that we need to conserve water. Well, that's, that's true, we do, even in times of plenty. So it's something that we take for granted because it's so cheap. But you see, it's all it's important to us. So, you know, I sound like a green person, but, you know, save your water, and it's good to be aware of issues like that. <coughs> but not be scared by them, but be, be aware of them. Yeah, um, it seems like a lot of the work that you've demonstrated here was related to the mining industry, but, and obviously they use massive water, but apart from the mining industry, which other industries use an awful, and pollute not a lot of water? I mean, I'm aware of all industries using masses of water in any product that they produce. So which ones would you say are the worst? And then there's another question after that about bio using biological remediation, mm, yeah. which is, you know, I can yeah. see that once you've had the spill, once you've had the post-contamination, you probably have to use physical and chemical processes. But if you're working at systems, preferably smaller scale systems, then maybe to, is there a possibility of using the plants? Yes, I forgot your first question. <laughs> <laughs> which kind of industries thank are you. the yeah, worst polluters you. of water? Okay, so the big industries that pollute water are actually agriculture by use of fertilizers and, and so on. And I suppose chemical industries are the next one. But especially in place, chemical industries, the tanning industry, that sort of thing. Again, especially in places where it's not regulated. So industries that, that use a lot of chemicals added to water and don't recycle the water that they, they use, that's a big problem. 
agriculture is, is a big polluter of water even in this country because, again, it, the scale is vast. And if you think, if you've got a field and you've added a fertilizer with phosphate and nitrate, and what's we got? Those are the two main ones, and potassium as well. Um, yes, some of it's going to be taken up by the plants that grow, but a lot of it is going to be leached as well. So a lot of our waters here in, in England are full of nitrate, and nitrate is notoriously difficult to treat. So they're, they're the two main, and that, that's global as well, agriculture and, and industry. But the answer to your second question is actually optimistic, but underused. Um, there is a lot of work going on on bacterial remediation, but likewise there's a lot of suspicion, because we hear bacteria and we think, oh, they're terrible, they're going to kill us, you know, they're pathogenic. But actually, the bacteria that are used in these systems are not pathogenic at all. They, they live off the chemicals in the system. So, for example, I've, I've worked with a lady, uh, sorry, it's a mine example, but in a place called Yellowknife in Canada, where we looked at underground slimes that were produced by bacteria. And the bacteria there will convert arsenic from the form of arsenic 3 plus to the form of arsenic 5 plus, which is like toxic. So we actually proposed this as a remediation method because the bacteria were there anyway. We didn't have to introduce them, they were happy. And there's a lot of suspicion about bacteria. That's the number one problem. The chemical methods, even though they're polluting and nasty, are tried and tested and cheap. cheap. Um, the other problem is, um, in some cases, keeping the bacteria alive is an issue. So even though we know that they do the job really well, really well, often better than chemical ways, but finding the right environment for them to thrive it is, can be difficult and feeding them the right nutrients. But there's a growing um, trend to look at using bacterial treatment. And in fact, I'm visiting, a, I'm going to Canada for Easter, so I'm visiting a company in Toronto and we're looking at doing some collaboration. That's exactly what they do. So they're going to old tailings dams and they're using bacteria to look at extracting metals. So it's, it's small, but I'm, I'm hoping it's growing. Uh, so that is good news, I hope. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, going back to the arsenic you yeah. know, at the surface level, if we found a way to stabilize you know, the arsenic itself, would that mean it would be less of a pollutant and affect less human health? Yes, yes. You know, if you remove the arsenic, over time, people do actually recover. So I understand, I'm not a health person, but as long as the diet is good and if they haven't taken too much arsenic in, then yes, you know, that, you take the arsenic away and things do improve. So that's, that's what a lot of the NGOs are looking at, you know, installing these systems in the village and household scale to, to have safe water that people can drink. The irrigation scale is, there are two ways they use our, um, water in those countries, for drinking and largely for irrigation. They're targeting more of the drinking scale than, rather than the irrigation scale, because it's so vast. But at the same time, they're looking at growing crops that are more tolerant and might not take up the arsenic so much. So there, again, there's, there's big hope. And as more research is done and more methods are found to provide arsenic-free water, then hopefully the situation will improve. Sorry, there was a question there, please. Hi. Yes, I, I, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, the, as this is your field of research, I'm sure you're aware of this, but the, um, the, the expo in the lab this year Oh, right. I didn't know that, actually. So there will be lots of NGOs there. And, uh, and, could, uh, and, and as you were saying, you're sort of collaborating with lots of, lots of companies and organizations. I wondered whether there was sort of anything that that, um, that, that they were planning to uh, uh, sort of contribute to, uh, to that. And uh, because the, the whole Milan Expo this year is sort of as the lead up to the, um, the climate mm. conference mm. in Paris. I wasn't aware of it, to be honest, but I'll certainly have a look at it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah but please get to know. Yep, sorry. We'll do that one and then we'll come back to you. <laughs> I was interested in the, the metal-eating bacteria. What's the problem? Is it to do with the pH? Because obviously one of the problems with the pollution of water is that it increasingly becomes more acidic, which can be a problem for most biochemistry. Is that one of the problems, or is it to do with temperature, or is it an amalgam of different it's, things? It's everything. It's keeping the temperature <laughs> right. I mean, bacteria have a good range, like yeah, we do, so yeah. that they can live. Because pH, providing enough nutrients is another yeah. issue. Um, 
in, some, in a lot of cases, they're tolerant to certain levels of metals, but there might be a threshold where they might just die. Um, so it's, it's controlling concentration of fluids, nutrients, it's a lot of temperature, all of those things. Yeah, and what about cold factors, like, you know, hollow things like that? Probably. You'll have to ask my microbiology colleague. Yes, <laughs> probably. Uh, and uh, the thing I know about it is it's work on bacteria. Uh, working on minerals in some ways is great because they don't grow and well, they do if you grow them in the lab, but they, once they're there, they're there. We're, we're doing experiments with bacteria it takes much longer because you have to keep them alive and, and it's, it's just more time consuming and intensive. So, yeah, it is, it's good environmental microbiologists if any of you are interested in doing that. Yeah? When we go to foreign countries, they tell us um, the, the tap water is okay for the locals to drink. The tourists should drink the tap water. Is that correct? Is there any sort of bacteria or something inside the water? Yeah. Partly, yeah. It, they often say it's, it's that you're not you, your stomach is just not used to the local microbes. So you're not adapted. Um, so if you're there for a short period of time, and yes, drinking bottled water, which theoretically is treated, is probably a, a wise thing if you don't want to get sick. Um, but over time, you would become, a, just like we are adapted to the microbes in London water, you know, they're not hurting us. Um, it does take time to adapt. It's not, as I understand it, it's not necessarily that they're full of arsenic or anything, it's just the local flora and the bacteria that live in the water. So over time, you know, I think you should a lot of places, the tap water is a lot better than it used to be. Um, but if you're only there for a short time and want to be well, then unfortunately, bottled water is the way to go. Um, it'd be nice to think there'd be recycling systems for all these plastic bottles someday. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the other so much yeah. The implication of your answer is that the people who come to the UK from abroad yeah. might just well boil the water. Well, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not an engineer. I, I, well, I know that we treat our water very well, not only for uh, inorganic elements like this, but they wouldn't, they probably, in our country, they wouldn't let water be treated, be released if it was full of bacteria that could cause harm. So I don't think you need to boil your own water. I don't think visitors do either. Um, but again, you know, it depends how sensitive you are. You, you know, um, the best thing is just to try a little bit first and see how you get on. But, I wouldn't boil your London water unless perhaps, you know, the government told you to, unless there was a big storm or a big problem with some of the pipes and so on. It, it's generally hot countries where the bacteria, these, these pathogenic bacteria and viruses thrive a lot more. Sorry. Yeah, no, just to lay the fears, having worked in oceans, oh, there we go. In, yeah, there's usually enough chlorine so there we that go. by the yeah. time it reaches the tap, there's still enough chlorine to kill any bacteria. So, it's only if there's contamination in the, in the process in the pipeline, that's where it causes problems. But what they're, what, why filtering is useful is because there are other things that are non-bacterial that protect people. Yeah, but I don't think you're going to get that here. I've never heard of, well, apart from the beer problem in Manchester, I haven't really heard of any problems. Okay, I'd like to have a quick commercial break. Tomorrow evening at 5.30, we have a lecture by Martin Imer on recognizing faces. And at 7 o'clock, we have one on looking at interior cells by Alan Lowe. And on Thursday, we have three slightly shorter lectures from the Baby Lab on the psychology of the developing brain. So I'd just like to thank Karen once again for an excellent evening and answering so many interesting questions. Thank you.